I want to start the introduction to deep learning by using an example from shallow learning. Uh, but that will nevertheless tell us a lot of useful concepts that will also be used for deep learning methods. So let us start with an example from physics. Consider that we have a spring attached to a wall and on the other side we will attach weights to the spring. Depending on the weight we will induce a gravitational force pulling on the spring and that will extend the spring. In an ideal spring this extension is simply proportional to the force and thereby proportional to the weight attached. And the proportionality constant k tells us whether the spring is stiff, so responds little to the weight attached, or whether it's floppy and responds a lot to the weight attached. Now suppose we don't know the proportionality constant and want to find it out by measurements. Then we will attach different weights and measure the corresponding extension x of the spring. We put these measurements in a plot and assuming that we make a measurement error, a little measurement error epsilon i every time we do so, uh, these measurements will not exactly follow a line but will be scattered around a line. Now the task is to fit the line and in particular fit the slope which in this case is exactly the spring constant. In general in such a 1D linear regression we may also want to fit the intercept. In this spring example we have already removed the intercept because we have defined uh, um, that to be zero but in general that's another parameter we might want to fit. Now in many practical cases we will want to do regression with data that is not following a linear law. For example, we might have such a nonlinear function where we make measurements e of l, um, which depend quadratically on l. And again, we want to find out what is the parameter k in this equation. This is related to the ex example in the last slide. This is actually the energy of an ideal spring. And if you differentiate this with respect to l, you get the, the force law of the ideal spring. Now, the trick here to fit this still with linear regression is to use variables in which uh, the regression is linear. And that basically means we define a new variable x as l square. Now in this new variable um, our e of x is just one half k of k times x, so it's linear in x. And we can now solve k by applying linear regression. So tr this trick is basically called linear uh, regression in feature spaces. So um, we had a nonlinear regression problem, but we made it linear by going into the right feature space. That's a very common trick in machine learning. Now let us formalize linear regression. So we are giving a so-called training set of m points. And each of these data points consists of a point where we have done the measurement called xi and a so-called label yi. So in our example xi could be the extension and yi could be the force. So in general we will write these two in a vector. So x vector contains all the x's, y vector contains all the y's. And we are looking for model equations which describe the measurement data approximately. So we, we want to learn a model f which predicts the labels y, i with uh, good accuracy. And this model depends on one hand on the measurements x i, so the inputs um, of our regression problem and also parameters w that we need to learn. 
So we can do this by minimizing the residuals, so the differences between the labels, the observed labels, and the predictions of the model. So yi minus f of xi and the parameters w. Now in a linear regression problem, this function f has the following form. It is a sum of weighted terms. These weights are the parameters that we call w1 to wn. And uh, these weights multiply some feature functions or basis functions phi1 to phi n. These feature functions are in general nonlinear functions. So that this is what we have used in the last example. There we have defined a feature x square in order to make the nonlinear regression problem linear. So the feature functions are generally functions in which we believe that the problem becomes linear and then depending on which machine learning method we'll use we'll either define these functions from the beginning or we will learn them. In deep learning we generally learn those functions. So but now let's just assume these guys are given and uh, then we can write our linearly squares regression problem as follows. So we define a matrix X in which uh, we simply evaluate the value of each of these feature functions at every data point. So it's a matrix that is number of data points times number of feature functions. And now we can write the linear least squares regression problem as the minimization over parameters w of the following vector norm. And in this case, we just use a two norm. Uh, so that's the Euclidean norm of the residual or distance vector between the labels y and the model predictions x times w. So, and this quantity which is being minimized here is called the loss function. So we minimize the loss function over the parameters. Now, before moving on, I want to show you an example where linear least squares regression can be used that is very surprising. Um, so what you see here is a molecular dynamic simulation of two proteins that are diffusing around and binding to each other. And um, a very widely used way to model such molecular dynamic simulations and also dynamics of other many body systems are Markov state models. And the Markov state model basically follows the idea that the state space of these molecules, which can be very high dimensional, can be divided into substates and we can uh, model their dynamics as a Markov jump process between these substates. So each of these arrows here corresponds to a transition probability or a transition rate between these substates. Now we can um, either try to find the transition probabilities or rates between these states with a likelihood method where we basically ask what is the most likely Markov chain given the sequence of transitions we have observed in the data but we can also model it as follows we can say take the trajectory data so take the assignment of the time series to um, each of these discrete states over time and make a regression of those uh, assignments to the next time point. And in this case we can also learn the matrix of transition probabilities by using linear least squares regression. So this is an example of um, a problem that is not where it's not obvious uh, from the beginning but where we can formulate the problem as a linear least squares regression problem. And that is actually true for many, many problems in the sciences and engineering. So in the right representation, many problems can be cast into regression problems. And in the right space, they are linear. Of course, in many cases, we don't know what is the right space in which things become linear. 
And that is particularly an example or a situation where deep learning is important in order to learn the representation in which things are linear. So now we have learned um, something about linear least squares regression. You have learned what a training data set is and what a loss function is. And now we will go to another important problem um, of machine learning in general, both shallow and, and deep machine learning. And that is validation, cross-validation, and hyperparameter selection. And um, the problem of validation is we want to understand how good our model is on data that we haven't used for training. After all, in machine learning, we are interested in making predictions. So we can train our data on a training data set X using training labels Y. And this resulting loss or error is the training error. But we would like to understand how good the model is on predicting test data. Um, secondly, we are interested in hyperparameter selection. So hyperparameters are essentially all kinds of things that are not parameters. So for example, a hyperparameter choice would be what types of functions phi we use in linear least squares regression. So what feature functions we are using. As another example, hyperparameter choices also include really general choices. For example, do we use linear least squares regression, kernel regression, or a neural network to fit our data? That is also a hyperparameter choice. But let us stick with feature functions in linear least squares for now. So it is very easy to see that we cannot learn these feature functions in the training algorithm. Because if we could do that, we could find functions that are essentially delta functions, which are just defined on the data points on which we train and give us the exact correct labels on these data points, but predict, for example, zero anywhere else. So this, this linear least squares regression solution has learned functions which make the training error zero, so you cannot improve it more, but it gives a horrible prediction. It basically makes no prediction on, at all. It says always zero outside the training data, which is obviously wrong. So you cannot learn hyperparameters using your training algorithm. It's a different problem. Okay, speaking about validation first. So in general, when we have a machine learning problem, we are interested in making a prediction. So we divide our data set into a training set and a test set or validation data set. For now, we will use the words test set and validation data set synonymously. They are in general different things, but uh, for now we will only need two sets, training set and the other data set, which we will call validation or test set for now. Now, we train our model, and that means our parameters, w, using the training data set by minimizing the loss function, such as the prediction error of the linear least squares regression problem. Now, the resulting loss function or error is the training error or training loss. It's the error we make on the training data and it is exactly what we have minimized for. Now we can apply our learned parameters to the test data set and compute what error we're making there with those parameters. And this error, which is usually higher, is called the test error or test loss. And it provides a metric how well our model generalizes to new data. And this error can be used for hyperparameter optimization. Now, in the last example, we had one training set and one test set. And if our 
data set is not very large and contains, for example, some rare events, so some samples that are exceptional in some sense, then we can have the case that we make an unlucky division into training and test data. So in other words, perhaps there is a, an accumulation of a certain rare event in the test data that is not present in the training data or vice versa. So in that case, we do not get a representative sample in the training data and the test data. And in order to avoid such problems, one often averages over different divisions of training data and test data. And um, a common way to do this is so-called cross-validation. So um, in k-fold cross-validation, what we do is we divide our data into k-folds, in this example, four, and uh, we consider all four uh, ways to divide our data set into a test fold, which is one case of the data. And the training data is then the remaining k minus 1 divided by k uh, part of the data. And we do this k times. And now we do training for the training data and testing on the test data k times. And we average the result. And uh, the resulting validation error, error, the resulting average validation error is called cross-validation error. Now in hyperparameter selection, we select the hyperparameter such as the feature functions so as to minimize the validation error. Right? We cannot optimize them by minimizing the training error, but we can um, choose them in such a way that we minimize the validation error. And um, when we do this, we will see that there is an optimum for certain hyperparameter selections. So for example, consider the following data shown as the bl blue points here. Um, this is a one-dimensional regression problem. We have generated this data by using a quadratic function shown here in red. And the data is scattered around this red function. And now we consider f fitting uh, the data with polynomials. And the hyperparameter is the degree of the polynomial that we consider. So uh, we could consider linear regression, so degree 1, uh, shown here on the left. We could consider degree 2 in the middle, or a really high degree, so that's a, a degree 10 polynomial here, shown in the right. And as you see, the degree 1 choice, so just fitting the data with a linear model is really bad. Fitting the model with uh, order 10 polynomial is also pretty bad because we could fit the training data much better, but we make really poor predictions. So in some cases, we're really far away from the actual red curve, which has generated the data in the prediction. And in between, uh, for a degree 2 model, we are pretty, we're doing pretty well. So indeed, it shows that in, in the prediction error uh, that for this example degree 2 is the optimal choice. So it's the sweet spot for our hyperparameters. And this example is typical for machine learning as generally learning problems follow the following qualitative behavior. So we have on one hand hyperparameter choices which determine how complex a model is or how expressive it is. Roughly speaking, how many degrees of freedom does our model have to fit the training data? Um, on the other hand, we have error. Training error or prediction error, for example, measured as cross-validation error. And as we make the model more complex, the training error always goes down because we have more degrees of freedom to fit our training data points. But in the cross-validation error, we will have an optimum somewhere for an intermediate model complexity. Below, we underfit the training data, we underfit the, the, the data, and we make 
poor predictions because our model is too simple. Above, we are overfitting on the training data and we make poor predictions because we have essentially learned the training data by heart, but we do not generalize well.